we are gathered here for our third annual celebration of the John P. Glasser Health Informatics Society. Uh, many of you in this audience know SBMI, but for those of you who do not know, who have not followed us recently, uh, I want to give you a brief uh, overview about the school before I move to the next step. Okay, I think all of you have, probably some of you have seen this like new vision of our school, uh, transforming data to power human health. So we're gonna solve our problem with health, okay, over the next century, I guess, maybe sooner. So the school is a academic program in biomedical informatics. If you look across the country, there are about 70-ish. It goes up and down, I think today about 75, uh, 75 institutions have a program. Uh, most of them are typically the department or division of department in med school. As you look at our school, SBMI, at the bottom, Texas, everything here has to be big, so we are uh, the biggest one, I think, by many measures. And we are the only program as independent school. And, you know, Vino takes, uh, we are the only one in Texas. So we are big and doing well. And our students are from everywhere, if you look at it. This is more like the United Airlines like uh, destinations, right? So I think we are growing faster than the airlines. So that's something you can uh, t t take a note. And for our school, our primary mission is education, and we educate the current and future leaders, innovators, and problem solvers for health care, health prevention. And this is our, it's not our beautiful building, it's a building at a rise because we did not have a building, but that's going to change. So we have a new building. Uh, I can imagine somewhere in this direction on the top of the garage. It's a massive two-story building with 45,000 square feet. It's not too big, but it's reasonably big enough that we can claim it's our home. So this is the artist rendering. And uh, so if you think about that in the right direction, eventually the building will be bigger and better than everything you see now, okay? Okay, so with uh, the new building and all the wonderful students, uh, we also have very transformative and disruptive and innovative faculty. And uh, this is a picture we took from our retreat uh, a few months ago. And you can see that uh, we have a lot of faculty, they are the real faculty, regular. Uh, there are many people here who are adjunct. So you are not in this picture. If you can ask me to pay you 1% of your salary, then I become a regular faculty member here. <laughs> it's not too hard, okay. So we are, this, we have a 47 here, and we have three coming by the end of this year. And we are still growing. So there's no limit for the size. Uh, as you can see from the rest of the program, this field is still in a very early stage. Okay, so this is a very good summary about our school, the history. Our school is 21 year old now. Uh, started with a few faculty members in 1997. And if you look at it, the transformation, the, the progression of the different programs, each horizontal bar is a cluster of research or educational program, typically a center or core. As you can see that we have added more and more, especially up to 2013. Most of the programs are in the medical AI, big data, analytics. That's the future uh, that's driving, this is the area that's driving the future of healthcare for the next, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And if you are curious, the yellow uh, part, that's actually the growth of our student enrollment. You can see some dramatic growth over the past five, six years. So this chart is kind of a, I typically correlate this one with Apple's stock price. The correlation is very good. If you are a statistician, the R square is 0 0.92 or something. Very, very, very good, okay? But today we have a very different graph I want to show you. That's something that is even more uh, interesting. So this is the growth of the HIMSS attendance. I only picked the past uh, 17 years from year 2000. And you can see that the uh, attendance has been almost tripled over this uh, time period. So the growth is dramatic, and that's indication of the field. And for the future, if 
PIMS does not break up into several organizations, it's going to be much bigger. And the one person behind that curve is honorary for today's event. I will uh, uh, let uh, John Glosser to come to the stage to introduce our uh, honorary. But before that, I want to say a few words about John. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, this society is named after John. John was so gracious to let us to use his name to establish the John P. Glosser Informat Health Informatics Society, which was created to acknowledge the contributions of innovators, educators, researchers in the field of health informatics. Uh, to recognize people and uh, make connections for people to do networking out of this. So John has a very established career, and I cannot name all of them, because especially without my smartphone, I cannot go through the list. I do the best from my brain, maybe seven plus minus two items. So John got his PhD from Minnesota Health Informatics, and some years later he became the CIO of Partners Healthcare in Boston. And I don't know when, but eventually he went to Siemens Medical, became the CEO of the Siemens Medical. And after Siemens was either merged or acquired or whatever I call with Cerner, uh, he became a senior vice president over there. And he is still the senior vice president at Cerner Corporation uh, until I miss you there today. And uh, again, John is a universally recognized thought leader in health informatics. So we're so glad that uh, John let us use his name. Uh, so this is the third year uh, celebration. Uh, we had uh, three honorees. John apparently was the number one because he's on the first fan of this society. And during the first year of uh, uh, new members, we got the first one in 2016, and Ivor Nelson right here. And Rob, can you stand up and uh, with John? Let's give them a hand. <clears throat> Our another uh, awardee last year, David Bates, professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he has a schedule, a scheduling company, cannot come here, but uh, he sent his best wishes to everybody here, the honorees and uh, John and everybody here. So I stop here, I will let John to introduce our honoree for the day. <clears throat> so I'm, as you might have gathered, John Glasser. Before I start the introduction, I just want to, as Jaji mentioned, some correlations here. I'll give you one that you can amaze your family and friends with in the one or where in the world are you spending your time. So if you take the butter production of Bangladesh and the U.S., combine them, and correlate that with the Standards & Poor 500 index, you'll get an R squared of 0.95. Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> so watch butter production. It'll tell you how to invest your, your savings, your life savings, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, Anyway, it is, it is uh, uh, my pleasure to be here. You know, as Jaji mentioned, the, the John P. Glasser Health Informatics Society was created to recognize uh, innovation in the field of healthcare IT. And, and, reg and it understands, the award understands, the society understands, that innovation comes from multiple sources. It comes from academia, uh, it comes from government, it comes from the industry, and it comes in multiple forms. So it comes in the forms of new and novel applications or technologies that are introduced. It comes in the form of standards being set and created. It comes in the form of implementation and organizational performance, taking big jumps uh, as a result of that. And it comes in the form of uh, individuals and leaders who bring the industry together, convene them, such that the collective power of a very diverse range of professions uh, and interests, uh, it helps work together uh, to advance the cause here. Um, now, for, and that sort of leads into uh, uh, Steve Lieber, who is the awardee this year. Now, for 17 years, uh, H. Stephen Lieber, I don't actually know what the H stands for, but I'm sure it's heroic or something along those lines. Uh, anyway, heroic Steve, as we call him, um, served as president and CEO of the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, which is, as you all know, is the acronym of HIMS. Uh, HIMS is about 95 million, a little over 95 million in revenue. 
Um, it is a uh, mission-driven nonprofit, uh, operates on a global scale, uh, being present in 40 different countries, including offices in the UK, uh, the US, Germany, and Singapore. It's one of the 10 largest uh, U.S. Healthcare Association, so you add in the AMA and the AHA, and it's in the top 10. Uh, and it's actually the largest of its kind in focusing on healthcare uh, IT, and that's both in the U.S. but also globally. As you perhaps know, and was mentioned, uh, oops, ah, wanted to, whew, I spoiled something. Ah. Uh, we'll get to this in a second here. That's why I'm not, I'm not allowed to get near the podium here. <laughs> Remember when I was a CIA, I used to go into the data center, and they, before I go into the data center, the tech wizard would say, John, put your hands in your pocket and keep them there, okay, during the <laughs> entire time that you're down here. Uh, but anyway, is, you know, and you know that the HIMSS conference is the event uh, in, globally in the world with 40,000 individuals and 1,000 in the exhibit hall, et cetera, and it is the gathering of the industry uh, and has been for several, several years. Now, in his leadership role with HIMSS, uh, Steve was instrumental in representing the healthcare industry, uh, IT industry, in a wide variety of government, uh, both U.S. and overseas circles, uh, industry circles and associations, uh, and he's provided uh, leadership both within HIMSS, uh, but also across the industry on a wide variety of issues uh, and challenges that we collectively face. Uh, he's moved on, as we'll talk about in a couple of seconds, uh, but even in his new role, he continues to exhibit uh, considerable influence and impact on the healthcare IT you know, agenda. So uh, his contributions are significant uh, and continue to be that. Now, when he was at HIMSS, he established HIMSS uh, as a global leader. Uh, I was involved in HIMSS way back in the 1990s, and it was not a global leader, and under Steve it has become that, um, in terms of, you know, advancing electronic health records, uh, interoperability, engaging consumers, uh, and most importantly, taking the technology, enabling organizations that deliver care uh, to effectively apply it, such that the care is safer, it's of higher quality, more efficient, and achieves the mission that we collectively we all aspire to when we get into this field, and particularly get into the use of the technology to help us. Um, since retiring from him, so, uh, and actually he's not retiring, he's just moved on to a different line of, uh, of work, et cetera, but he certainly has shifted. Uh, he's become a principal for Avizos uh, Partners, where he serves as a consultant to associations in areas such as governance, helping them deal with operational and strategic issues, and also consider international and business expansion. Uh, in addition, uh, he is a uh, of counsel uh, at Quick Leonard Kiefer, which is a retained search firm, which has uh, got an extraordinary range of clientele, uh, from health systems to health plans to associations, and covers the gamut, uh, and is perhaps known to all of you, probably should be known to all of you uh, as we go forward. Uh, and in addition, he also serves uh, as a um, executive advisor to Next Wave Connect, which is an early stage IT uh, an advisory uh, company that focuses on empowering associations with a series of content um, driven technologies. Now, it's not surprising to all of you, he has accrued many honors you know, over the course of his uh, illustrious career, including an honorary life member of the American Hospital Association, an honorary life member of HIMSS, uh, an honorary life member of the American Society of Health Risk Management. I hope they're giving you money along with the honorary life member type <laughs> things here. Uh, and also has been Modern Healthcare publishes a list of the top 100 most influential people in the healthcare industry, and Steve has appeared on that list uh, multiple times. Uh, in addition to serving on multiple boards and, and uh, uh, panels, et cetera. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in this industry for quite some time, 30 plus years, and I've gotten to know some extraordinary people in the course of my time here. Uh, there are very few that are as effective as leaders as Steve Lieber. So I think it's just it's extraordinary uh, what he's been able to do and its impact on the industry. So Steve, uh, you need to start working your way up here because we're gonna say nice things to you, but, and we're gonna let you talk here. But before we do that, this is news to you. All right, and we, I almost screwed it up here by doing this thing. There is a congratulatory video tribute that has been prepared by your colleagues at uh, Quick Leonard Keepers. I think, Steve, you're the culprit behind this, I believe, here. Uh, they were unable to join you, but wanted to humiliate you, okay? So uh, we're delighted to have that video. So mark us wherever you are. Uh, is that you back? Okay, go, let's run this video. Innovation matters in healthcare, and Steve Lieber understood why it mattered. To him's and in healthcare. During his 17 years as HIMSS president and CEO, HIMSS became an influential association, voice, thought leader, resource, and advisor driving global transformation of health and healthcare through the best use of IT. Steve helped build HIMSS as a global operation, one reaching engaged healthcare professionals across the globe. 
In these 17 years, hymns had grown from 10,000 to more than 70,000 members across the globe. This healthcare community helped fulfill the hymns mission at that time, better health through the best use of IT. In recognition of his accomplishments as an innovator for HIMSS and for the global healthcare community, HIMSS established the H. Stephen Lieber Innovator Scholarship, awarded for the first time at HIMSS 18. Through the HIMSS Foundation, this scholarship recognizes and supports the next generation of innovators in health information and technology. Thank you, Steve, for your spirit of innovation and valued leadership in improving health and healthcare with the best use of IT. Now, Steve, as part of this, we have the uh, medallion that we will uh, we will give to you, and it formally brings you into this uh, society. This thing's heavy, okay? So I uh, hope you've been doing your sit-ups and stuff like that to prepare for the way this. But anyway, Steve, welcome to the society. Well-deserved. It's a pleasure to have you there. Great. Uh, and the podium is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Um, actually, there is another video that uh, was the work of... Mr. Nelson, where, oh, there he is right there, which was the one I was afraid you were going to show. <laughs> it was quite humorous, uh, but this is much more of a dignified audience, and we won't inflict that one on you. But I do want to first uh, thank John Zheji and the Society for this incredible honor. I want to thank Steve Dirks and my colleagues at Quick Leonard Kiefer and also Mr. Ivo Nelson at Next Wave Connect for their help in providing me with a soft landing as I exited hymns and take some time to figure out what the next chapter is. Because I don't call it retirement, although I did at the time, but that was really just a courtesy so that I didn't have to say, I'm done here, I'm ready to go do something else and bye. So you gotta couch it in, in some other language. And so it was retire from hymns, but uh, I really am, I'm, I'm embarking on uh, and some new directions in terms of trying to leverage some of the things that I've learned in some different places as we do executive search in the healthcare space, bringing the, the network that I have in the technology space to, to Quick Leonard, working with Ivo and his team at Next Wave Connect, bringing my association experience into to that effort. And it's really a lot of fun and, and a tremendously different experience than I had at Hims. So I thank you for, for the honor. What I'm going to do over the next, say, 30 to 40 minutes is talk to you about health information technology from a policy standpoint. And as you can see from the title here, my uh, premise is that it was federal policy that transformed us from a almost exclusively paper-based process to a highly digitized environment. Now, throughout this, there are, of course, very many other actors and contributing factors. But I will conclude the remarks with a cross-border comparison to make my point in terms of how significant U.S. federal policy was in changing the way healthcare operates from a technology standpoint. And healthcare, as we all know, is a business sector that doesn't respond to economic principles the same way that many other businesses do. Uh, it is not a sector where the uh, goods are freely traded among educated buyers and sellers. And it's very re highly regulated at both state and federal levels. And this is not a presentation on reimbursement, but we do have to recognize the relationship of the reimbursement system to the environment we had and we have. Because as we all know in the US, we are not paid for information management. There is no 
uh, reimbursement for specifically for information systems or technology, or at least there wasn't for a long time, and then there was a window where things changed. And we also recognize that in healthcare, the reimbursement system does not uh, positively affect or reward business efficiency. We are incented to lower our costs in ways that also lower our revenues. And so it creates an interesting sort of environment where to some extent we have incentives for inefficiency, waste, and even error by paying on a manufacturing per piece model. Now some of that has changed and we are going through and experiencing some, some different uh, types of um, trends. But I want to take us back and talk about some things that went on over the past uh, 17, 18 years. But I want to start with, with this, and, and it's really a tip of the cap to some significant experiences I had over those 17, 18 years around the world. This is a slide that I have used in literally almost 40 countries. There are slight modifications to it, but not much. The environments across the globe are very similar. The issues that you face are the same that are faced in most every other country. And this list that you see here is a list that resonates all over the globe. And in fact, the way of addressing these issues also is very similar in that technology and information systems, which I don't call a tool, but I call an asset, is very much the mechanisms by which these issues can be addressed. But as I say, with that as a background, understanding the problems that we're trying to solve, let's go back some uh, almost 20 years now. And a seminal report was issued by the Institute of Medicine in 1999 on healthcare and quality. And as you see here, uh, there was a number of significant findings that came out of this report. And it really is, although there was work <coughs> that was done many years before that, and as a matter of fact, the first computerized patient record was already some 30 years old by this time. But this is the point at which people started to recognize we've got a quality problem and our current paper-based environment is a problem. And the question that generally is being raised here is why is healthcare, again, this is 1999, why is healthcare predominantly using paper-based records? When, and again, for those of you that are old enough, remember 1999, when everybody's talking technology, everybody's talking the internet, everything is moving in that direction. And so from, from that report, as I say, two major conclu conclusions emerged. And there was recognition that at what was called at that time the computer-based patient record is essential technology for healthcare, and nobody is leading the challenge, leading the charge to address the challenge. Everybody is out there just sort of floundering about trying to figure out what to do. And there were many actors involved, but there was no coordination of it, no pr clear direct progress that was evident. We saw a rise of entrepreneurship in healthcare during the late 90s and early 2000s, but again, it's all over the map. And so it was an acknowledgement that something needed to happen. Some, somebody, some force needed to pull things together. <coughs> and where that occurred was going to be in, in government. So where were we as a society in terms of technology, just to <coughs> remind you of what the world was like in 1999-2000? A lot of places had made a lot of progress in the use of technology. Healthcare and the management of information from a technology standpoint was nowhere near what was happening elsewhere. 
So clearly the problem existed and had been acknowledged in the To Air is Human report. The likely solution of using technology to address those problems was fairly well accepted. Now I will say that during the early part of the first decade of, of this millennium, there was still some argument about whether or not technology was the answer. That did disappear by mid-decade. But generally speaking, uh, among most of us, it was clear that there was work that had to be done and we needed some forces to help drive that, that to conclusion. So let's start out looking at what went on in the federal policy arena and start out with the Bush years. These were years that were marked by voluntary effort. This is a period obviously under a Republican administration. It is a time where there was likely to be no big government action. Regulation is not the desired approach. It is simply a, as, as the first national coordinator for health information technology said to me at one point, at times I'm a cheerleader and I just simply have to cheer the troops on because I don't have any money, I don't have any regulatory authority. And, and it very much was a, a, a time where there was motivation and encouragement provided. There was no real incentive, but it very much was a time where the necessary groundwork for what was to happen later was laid. And so we reached uh, the State of the Union address in 2004. And this was a one-line Senate statement that was inserted into the President's address. And it was the first time that a sitting president had made a public statement about the role of technology in solving the problems in healthcare. And this was one that a lot of people spent a lot of time behind the scenes working on to get the administration to accept and just insert this one line. Nobody knew, I mean the insiders knew, but no, none of us knew until the speech was given, is it in or is it not? But it, the, the important thing here is that it, it started really for the first time to bring about a focus of the federal government on the use of technology to address the issues of quality in health care. Now, there are, as I said, many factors that are go going to contribute to where we ended up today. Some of them are policy and some of them are environmental. A little more than a year after this statement, Katrina hits. And so you have a massive impact on a major city in terms of a total disruption of civilization. Hospital scenes in terms of what happened in that city. And as was the case, and I know you've had the same problem here, IT oftentimes located in the basement. And the medical record storage is located in the basement and we all know what water does. It seeks its lowest level. And so all of this goes on in New Orleans with uh, Katrina. Hundreds of thousands are displaced. Medical records are destroyed. People are in need of care. And there's no way to figure out who is what in terms of their health care. You have people who are in, in disadvantaged conditions, health-wise, age-wise, and others. Um, rapidly displaced out of their homes, unable to take with them information to help piece it all together. And as, as at the time, um, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich noted, we had a most vivid case study demonstrating the value of electronic health records. And I would say that this experience very much was a driver in going from that one sentence, which is almost um, just a political line in President Bush's State of the Union address in 2004 into a rapidly mobilized <laughs> effort on the part of the federal government in terms of figuring out what are we going to do for our citizens and how are we going to piece together 
an electronic system to help these people get back on their feet in terms of their medical care. It also highlighted the problem, some of which still exist today, in how data couldn't be exchanged easily. The electronic environment was incomplete. But it was, as I say, an opportunity for uh, work to begin on figuring out a national infrastructure and a national policy on how to use technology to drive uh, improvement in healthcare. And what came out of this were a series of public-private partnerships. And again, a Republican administration was not going to have a massive uh, federal financial intervention, uh, nor implement major new regulations. But what they did is they reached out to a number of us to leverage the relationship that we as associations and others had with you in the provider sector, in industry and others, to help make things happen that government at that time under that administration really weren't willing or able to do. And so what came out of it were, were two um, quasi-governmental organizations. Um, the Certification Commission for Health Information Technology, which originally was the only body that was designated to certify products as meeting criteria, and the Health Information Technology Standards Panel, which was a multi-sector uh, partnership effort in order to identify and drive standardization. Not write new standards, but to identify, reconcile, and pull it together. And as I say, these were very much encouraged by government. They technically weren't formed by government. They were outside of government. And it was just simply the philosophy at the time that this is how we needed to go about doing this. And in fact, just to digress for a quick story, um, several of us were in Chicago, and David Brailer, who's the first national coordinator for health information <coughs> technology, was there speaking at one of our groups, and we all go to each other's events and that sort of thing. And he pulled three of us into a private room in the hotel, and he said, I need you guys to do something for me. I can't do it. And it was laying the foundation and the framework for these organizations, an environment that uh, quite honestly, wasn't replicated in subsequent administrations, uh, but it very much was the way in which that administration said, this is the way we're going to get things done. We're going to rely upon this public-private partnership. We, as the public government sector, will lend our verbal support to the directions you're going. Behind the scenes, we're going to give you guidance and direction on where we'd like to see these things go. Uh, but it was a, it, it was a, a very um, positive and, and collegial type of environment. And so that, that really did lay the, the fr framework and, and groundwork for a lot of things that happened later. As I say, there are environmental factors that also contribute. And the next one hit in 2008. So in 2008, um, the second crisis that really had a tremendous impact on health information technology and its use in healthcare systems today hit the Great Recession. The U.S. economy shrank by nearly 4%, four consecutive quarters of contraction. Never since the Second World War had that happened. The longest recession since the Great Depression. Six and a half million jobs lost, banks failed, automotive industry faltered, Hundreds of thousands, millions of homes went into foreclosure. And so there was a panic, is I think the best way to describe it, that was going on at the end of the Bush administration in terms of what can we do? How can we do it? Are we going to get the American society back on track or are we headed for the caves? And, and so at that time, as you will remember, national election, and uh, a new president is elected. And so as we were making the transition from the Bush years to the Obama years, there was clearly a sense of urgency. And as Rahm Emanuel, 
who was the first chief of staff for President Obama said, never let a crisis go by without taking advantage of it. And this very much was a situation where the incoming administration had a huge opportunity to do almost whatever it wanted. It's remembered that at that time, the Democrats controlled House and Senate. The economy was in a free fall. Something needed to happen. And so in the time period from the first Tuesday in November until the third or fourth Tuesday of January or of inauguration, there was clear direction that was being demonstrated by the Obama administration or the incoming administration of what they planned to do. And this very much highlighted an even stronger statement. And as you compare this to that made by President Bush some five years before, how significant of a change has occurred here in the thinking of the federal government. Now, com two completely different presidents, two completely different administrations, but clearly a new direction was about to emerge. And so here we have an era that is going to be marked by a complete 180 degree change from that which we'd seen before. Massive funding is coming down the pike. Major regulatory policy very much is going to be in play. And the federal government is basically making a statement, we are going to be the driver of health care, not just as it relates to technology, as we saw even later in the Obama administration, but health care in general. So in looking back over the previous years, as well as driven by their own political philosophy, the new administration looked at the situation and believed that the only way we're going to get somewhere is with funding incentives. That we are going to have to do something more than voluntary public-private partnerships on standards. And that w this will be the mechanism by which we will drive costs down and, and quality up. So what came out of it was this piece of must-pass legislation. It is a piece of legislation that if we look at it today, we can see what was going to be the major policy initiatives of the Obama administration. There was major funding for energy, education, and health care in this legislation. It created a number of new programs and services, and in particular, it introduced for the first time the opportunity for health care provider organizations and providers to receive direct payments for the adoption and use of technology. There are certain requirements in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Again, recovery and reinvestment, very much a strong political and policy statement about what the government expected to happen and what they felt were the major drivers in terms of how we get from where we were to where we are. It was designed to uh, stimulate investments in infrastructure. It was designed to address other structural problems across the economy. It was a pump priming uh, initiative across multiple sectors. And it was embedded in this was a huge amount of funding for health care technology. Now the remaining slides that I have is going to pick up on this point of investment and look at what it did in terms of driving change in the way hospitals in the United States use technology. But first I want to introduce to you, or for those of you that are familiar with it, a model upon which the following analysis I'm going to present to you is based. This is a model that was developed at Hims Analytics, 
electronic medical record adoption model. And basically, it is a stage type of model that, depending upon where you sit, there are certain expectations you can realize. The early stages are all about operational efficiency. The, the middle stages are about establishing the foundations of clinical quality. And then the highest stages are more about the realization of the benefits. And so we had developed this model back actually in about 2005, and it had received at first uh, considerable pushback from the CIO community. The group didn't really like that there was someone standing out there saying there is a way to do this, not that this is prescribed in order but the research shows that there are correlations between certain stages and certain outcomes and, and accomplishments. Uh, and then after a little while of getting used to it, it, it became embraced. But it wasn't until the passage of ARA and the introduction of meaningful use that this became such a significant measurement stick, not a driver, measurement stick in terms of what people were doing, what they needed to do. And so what we saw over the time period when some nearly $40 billion was spent in payments to provider organizations and providers, and what I'm providing you here is the data related to the organizations, and we saw a tremendous change in the adoption rates in terms of the number of hospitals at roughly stage five and above, which is sort of the threshold of meaningful use and above. And as you can see here, a uh, very significant change over a relatively short period of time. And again, let's think about what had happened between 99 and 2007 in terms of the conversation about IT adoption and use, and we still had only reached 2% that were at the upper levels. Of, of IT adoption. Now, to bring my point home and to reinforce the hypothesis that I have, which is the major driver of change in the adoption and use of technology in American hospitals was the federal policy and the accompanying payments associated with it, I want to look at the comparison between the US and Canada. These are very similar markets. The cultures of the two organizations in terms of general culture is similar. They, there were very similar adoption rates of technology in the mid-decade. Both have had a very strong federal level focus, policy focus, on healthcare and information technology. The big difference was the U.S. had financial incentives, Canada did not. And so what we saw in the United States, this is US only, a huge shift in terms of the score of American hospitals on the IT adoption, on the EMR adoption scale, from a national average of only 1.8. And so again, think about that, that was just about operational efficiency. We were good at making sure we were efficient. But it was some uh, nine years later, we've reached a national average of 4.8, very much moving into that level of being able to realize the true benefits of technology. Now, in and of it by, uh, by itself, okay, there could be a relationship between the federal policy and that shift, but you know, maybe not, maybe there are other things. But if we look at our friends and neighbors to the north, over the same time period, almost no change. 1.5 average to 2.0, very small change and very small shift, even though, again, as I said, the vendor community that serves that market, very similar to the U.S., the way in which they're paid is, is varied from ours, but the clinical practice is very similar. The setup of the hospital and, and care systems in Canada not that dissimilar to, to what we have. And so you can see in Canada over the same time period, very little change. So I'm going to conclude with that point 
that we have seen federal policy very much making the lives that we live today what they are. Federal government continues to focus on trying to influence the direction of health care, health care technology, and many other aspects in, wh in which we operate in our daily professional lives. There are many more stories that can be told about the role of policy in establishing what we do and how we do it, but I'm going to finish with that, and I thank you very much for your time and attention.